Gulf Breeze, Florida, November 11th, 1987. A local contractor named Ed Walters observes an unidentified flying object near his home in Florida and snaps five Polaroid photos of the object he sees. This kick starts a string of sightings that he and his wife have for multiple years, including Walters claiming to be immobilized by a bright blue beam multiple times by these craft. Over the course of the UFO being a presence in his life from 1987 to 1988, he supposedly took 32 photographs and even a video of the supposed UFO encounters he had. Not only did Ed Walters have these encounters, but also dozens and if not hundreds more had encounters with these objects in the late 1980s to early 1990s in the area around Gulf Breeze in Pensacola, Florida. Today, on Unblurring the Unknown, the Gulf Breeze UFO incident. Welcome back to Unblurring the Unknown. Um, my name is Dominic and I am your host today. Um, I just want to, before I get started, I just want to appreciate the support that everybody has given me over the past week or so just through getting the podcast started. I have had a lot of people reach out and express their support and and, and send me topic suggestions and, and I really do appreciate it and everybody's support. I It really means a lot to me and I can't even put it into words on how much it means to me. So, that being said, today's topic is on the Gulf Breeze UFO incident. Now, this is an incident that I had actually not have heard before. It, I, I hadn't heard it before until I started researching it. So, obviously, once I found it, I'm like, okay, this seems interesting. This is a UFO encounter, or multiple encounters that took period over a short number of years that I had never heard about, and it captured my interest. So, I was like, you know, my first episode was on true crime. Let me go the... Let me go the true crime, uh, I, my first episode was on true crime, sorry. And let me go the UFO route for my second episode. So, I decided to do it on the Gulf Breeze UFO incident. So, as I said in the intro, this story starts in November 11th, 1987, with a contractor named Ed Walters, when he observes an unidentified flying object near his home, and snaps pictures of it. He supposedly has sightings that start, obviously, in November of 1987, going into 1988, a six-month period that the UFO was in a part of his his life, and he had all these encounters with it. Um, he supposedly took 32 photographs and even a video. Like I said in the intro, these photos are available online. I will also have some of them posted to my Instagram. That is also brand new, my Instagram, Unblurring the Unknown. Um, you will see all the pictures I post from the episodes, so you guys don't have to dig through Google to find all the images I have from doing all my research. And to kind of put it in perspective, it kind of looks like a top. The the pictures of the UFO, it's a very interesting looking UFO. It's something that I hadn't seen before. It's like, I don't know if it's isolated to this particular incident or whatever, but it looks like a top. If you were to flip it, if you were to look at a top without the bottom tip, it has square windows and it looks like blue light emitting from the bottom of the craft in about a circle. Um, Ed Walters took what these, what photos he had and submitted to them to the Gulf Breeze Sentinel, which is a newspaper, under a pseudonym, so he and his family would not face ridicule. Because obviously he was concerned that people would ridicule him, saying he was trying to make this story up, that this was all ho ho this was all bogus, the photos weren't real. And after him putting these articles in the newspaper, sending these articles into the newspaper, other eyewitnesses in the area start to come forward of UFO encounters that they have started having in the area. The Gulf Breeze area saw a absolutely unprecedented spike in UFO activity during this time. Dozens of sightings were reported and, you know, they continue to report it. It's even more than dozens. Um, all the research I've done, you know, mentioned specific names. Um, some of them didn't and then also kind of said that a lot of people saw it but didn't report it, like politicians and police officers and things like that. Obviously, they didn't want to report that because they thought, you know, there was no 
um, legitimacy to that. Obviously, you know, during that time period, the the uh, awareness on UFOs was not where it is now. I think you know everything that's going on now with with UFOs, um, the multiple hearings that the government has had, and you know the videos the Pentagon released a couple years ago. The um, the availability of UFOs right now is very mainstream and is very easy to talk about it. Whereas if you look back in the 1980s, 1990s, that just was not the case. You know, you're going to get ridiculed on that because, you know, not people didn't believe in that. You know, that was a crazy thing to think about at the time. And obviously, over the period of the 1900s, you know, you had a lot of UFO encounters, but it was not something that was very mainstream and widely accepted. Um, especially in an area if you've never... You know, if an area is not a UFO hotspot and you say, hey, I saw a UFO, odds are you're going to be ridiculed on that, especially in the 1980s, 1990s, because they're just, like I said, it wasn't as as mainstream as it is today. So a lot of these sightings reported very similar things. A lot of them reported orange lights in the sky, blue beams of light, and even someone claiming to see a UFO land in her yard, and she said orange light was coming from the ground, um, and everything like that. And obviously these all took place in the Gulf Breeze, Pensacola area. And that being said, I kind of want to work into some notable sightings that kind of take place during the 1987 to 1989, 1990 range. Um, these were just names that were mentioned, obviously people who came forward to the newspaper. And you're going to hear me mention, um, you know, obviously the Gulf Breeze Sentinel a lot was a newspaper. Um, there also Pensacola News Journal, um, I mentioned quite a bit. And I did a lot of research through them just because they documented a lot of these instances as they were happening. And especially the Pensacola News Journal, they put the work in to getting to the bottom of this. And I can't really say that about a lot of other, you know, newspapers. They'll run an article and that's the end of it. I'll tell you what, the Pensacola News Journal put in their work to try and make sure that the story was told each kind of step of the way. So it was really kind of interesting to see a newspaper do that for once. Um, so just, I'll quit my rambling for a second and we'll go into some notable sightings during that time period after after the Ed Walters photographs. So always remember the Ed Walters photographs in the back of your mind because that kind of kickstarts the chain of events that kind of follow. In July of 1987, so this is before the Ed Walters photographs, Fenner and Shirley McConnell claimed to see a disc-shaped object with no wings that was hovering over their pier at their home. In November of 1987, Art and Mary Hufford claimed to see something quote-unquote gray, oval, and silent fly over the treetops that stayed in their view for multiple minutes. This is a, another separate incident. Brenda Polak, so this is a close acquaintance of Walter's. I didn't find a specific date on when this happened. Actually, uh, March of 1988. I forgot where I had that written down. So March of 1988, Brenda Polak, who happens to be a close acquaintance of Ed Walters, also observed something orange flying over the treetops while crossing the Pensacola Bay Bridge. When coming home to tell her husband, she learned that Ed Walters was actually showing him his photographs, his Polaroid photographs, and this kind of makes her realize that, oh, I'm not the only one to see this type of thing. Ed has seen it too, and he's got photographs of it. And it kind of gets her brain stirring as to, you know, this is a this is a, something that a lot of other people are seeing. It's not just her. It's not just isolated. And Brenda Polak later came out and said that she didn't feel like Walters was the type of person to fabricate these photos. Um, obviously, like I said, it seems like, you know, you had Fenner and Shirley McConnell in July of 1987 come forward about an encounter. And then it kind of seems like November in 1987 after the photographs, it kind of kicks everything back up. Um, in 1989, Jeff Thompson and his son reported seeing an unknown craft outside of his home and later tells of an encounter he had in before when he said supposedly watched a UFO being chased by military jets on November 11th, 1987. So if you remember the first time I mentioned the date, November 11th, 1987, that was the same day of Ed Walters' first encounter. So, obviously, Jeff Thompson didn't come forward with this first encounter that happened in November 11th, 1987, because, again, of ridicule. He got asked by journalists about UFOs, mentioned his sighting in 1989 with his son, and then came forward and mentioned also the sighting, the other sighting he had the same day Ed Walters had his first encounter and took the first photographs of um, the UFOs that he saw. 
And that kind of concludes some, some notable sightings during that time period. And obviously there was a lot more sightings that were going on. And a lot of people were reporting very similar things. And now during this time period, MUFON was a legit presence within the UFO community. Now, if you don't know what MUFON is, it is the Mutual UFO Network. And if I screwed that acronym up, I do apologize. I didn't mean to get that wrong. If I did, I'm pretty sure I got it right. Um, MUFON was a legit presence within the UFO community. Now, MUFON existed more or less during the during the late 1900s because of the uptick of UFO sightings and the government not really taking them seriously. So MUFON came together and said, okay, we are going to investigate these things and we're going to take them seriously because the government is not really doing that. So MUFON was being made aware, and the Florida Bureau of MUFON was being, ma being made aware of the spiker reports coming from the Gulf Breeze and Pensacola area, and believed the sightings, and they believed Ed Walter's photographs were genuine. However, MUFON was very split on whether or not Ed Walter's photographs were real or whether they were made up. But the majority of them believed the sightings that were coming out of the Gulf Breeze area. It was really the, the Polaroid photographs that people were really split on. Now, George Williams from the Florida Bureau of MUFON said for years that MUFON went back and forth on this story and eventually a wrinkle is found in Ed Walter's story and in the photographs that he took. This is kind of where the story takes an interesting turn and it's kind of, it's a good turn in a way because it adds more depth to this story and more, like I said, wrinkles to everything. So in 1990, Ed Walters moves out of his home in Gulf Breeze and the new owner, when exploring the attic, finds a model flying saucer wrapped in paper that he had stuffed in the attic like it was hidden. So it was constructed out of foam plates, cardboard, and plastic gel. And I will have a picture of that on my Instagram so you can see what this what this model looked like. So obviously when the new owner found the model, they sent it towards the local newspapers, obviously. And the Pensacola News Journal then publishes an article about the new homeowner finding the model in the attic of Ed Walters' former home. However, the model kind of comes under a little question as the homeowner didn't say anything about finding the model until he was interviewed by a local journalist. So, again, he finds the model, doesn't say anything, kind of brushes it off, and then the local journalist, obviously that area being, you know very popular for UFO sightings at the time, um, gets questions about UFOs and say, oh yeah, hey, no, I found this model in my attic, and, you know, doesn't really make a whole lot of sense, and then obviously, you know, journalists put two and two together and said, hey, this really looks like Ed Walters, Ed Walters UFO pictures, and then the whole situation becomes even messier when the Pensacola News journalists decide to try and recreate some of the original photos Walters took with the model and were able to get quote or were able to get them to a point where they quote unquote nearly duplicate them. And again, I will also have a picture of this up on my Instagram so you can see the original Polaroid that Ed Walters has took and the replica photo, the fake photo that the Pensacola News Journal took with the fake model. And I kind of wanted you to look at them. They look very, very similar. And that's just that's just the truth. So once this story came out about the fake model, Ed Walters has came forth and said that the model was planted. He claimed that it must have been planted there by people who didn't believe his story, thought he was making this whole thing up, that he wasn't being legitimate, or he even came he even stretched it further by saying that maybe the US government was trying to cast doubt on his entire story. In my opinion, it's extremely fishy, but a lot of everything about Ed Walters' story and then the new homeowner not coming forth about it is kind of fishy too. But I think Ed Walters is more fishy than anything else. Like, you don't just... Like, that's not really something you'd have. You know, like, if, if you say, hey, I report a UFO and you take pictures of it and then somebody finds a model of the UFO that it kind of looks exactly like it, that doesn't look great. So, um, to top all of this off, Ed Walters refused to take a polygraph test 
um, I believe multiple times, um, but he did refuse to take a polygraph test. But then Swine Day signed a uh, quote unquote sworn statement that what he saw was real and that the model that was found in the attic was not his. So I'm not exactly, I don't exactly know what a quote unquote sworn statement is. But last time I remember that's not a polygraph and there's people who lie all the time when they are under oath or they sign a, you know, a sworn statement. So I don't really buy that. That's like a way of, I feel like that's just a, a cheap way of getting out of the polygraph test because you know you're caught. And he kind of further added to this claim by saying that his wife was told by a neighbor that somebody had broken into their garage, went up into the attic and then left. And there's whole, there's wrinkles throughout this entire story. And, you know, if the new homeowner found the model and knew about the history of the area of that time, because I feel like during that time with the amount of heat that that story was generating, you kind of have to know about it. Um, if he knew the history of the area, why didn't he report it? Why would Ed Walters refuse a polygraph test if his photographs in stories were legit. And to top it all off, the Gulf Pre the Gulf Breeze PD never got a report about a a break in at Ed Walters' home. So again, if somebody had broken into Ed Walters' home and planted this supposedly fake model of the UFO The Gulf Breeze PD just never got got word of that. You know, if you're your neighbor and you see somebody's house, you know, if you see your neighbor's home being broken into across the street, odds are you're going to call the cops and say, hey, my neighbor's house is being broken into. It's on XYZ Main Street. Like, that's just common sense. You're going to do that. So if there was no break-ins reported to the Gulf, Bre Gulf Breeze PD, that tells me that maybe that claim in and of itself is also not legitimate. And after that six-month stretch into which Walters had his experiences, so we had that six-month stretch from November of 1987 into 1988, he had that six-month stretch where he had multiple encounters, he took multiple photographs, you know, allegedly saw the blue beams of light. Um, at one point he said that he was claimed to be immobilized by a blue beam of light on multiple occasions. Um, if he had these experiences for six months, why did they suddenly stop? That adds to it. Ed Walter says, obviously, there's a lot of things in this. He says, I'm pretty sure that, you know, there's a lot of things that we can't explain. And this is one of those things, you know, why his experience stopped. But for me, you know, did he think that the public was onto this hoax that he was trying to make up? You know, nobody can really come to the conclusion on whether or not Walters is telling the truth. And obviously this took place in 1987. So it's been, you know, over 30 years since this happened. So, and people are still split on it. So that kind of tells you what the general population thinks of, thinks of the story. Um, and again, it, it, it's one where I think, you know, again, why did they stop? Did they stop because for whatever reason? I, I, I'm not sure why they would stop. But obviously other people in the area were still having UFO sightings and encounters after Ed Walters had his stop. So if this was a new UFO hotspot and he was consistently seeing these sightings, did they stop because everywhere else had been already exposed to the UFOs? So we felt like he didn't have to keep spinning this yarn about these UFO sightings that he was seeing. And fans of the theory that Walter's images and encounters were genuine stood by the belief that he wasn't in it for monetary gain, that the story was not made up, this story was legitimate, and he was not in it for fame. He wasn't in it to try and get money out of it. He was doing it because he encountered it. He stood by his claims and he thought it was genuine. Those are the fans who stick by Ed Walters and say this entire story is legit. However, the Pensacola News Journal, like I said, the Pensacola News Journal really put in work and really tracked down a lot of information there. And they found out that Ed Walters was offered a book deal for his supposed photographs and his sightings that he encountered. And this book deal was worth an upwards of $200,000, but he also got 
rights for a ABC channel miniseries, which there was a much higher monetary amount than $200,000 attached to that. Which, again, it, it kind of seems like the cards are not stacked in Ed Walters' favor, in my opinion. For at least his story. Because you say, you know, if you're not in it for fame and you're not in it for monetary gain, then why are you taking a book deal? Why are you taking a TV series deal? If this is a legitimate story, you're trying to tell your story and you're trying to make sure that everybody is aware of what you went through and what you witnessed and that everything was real. Um, if you're taking all this money, I'm always going to doubt you because if you're trying to tell your side of the story and you know it happened to you, I mean, money can change people, obviously, but I don't know if it would... I would not take $200,000 for a book deal if I was, say, telling a legitimate story. If I was telling a legitimate story, odds are I'd write the book myself because at the end of the day, I want everybody to know the story. But obviously, that's my personal opinion. So him getting the offers for money for the rights of his story puts everything in a, a, a bit much finer lens on whether or not this was real or not. So obviously, I want to turn to the images in particular. Um, I talked a little bit about them, and like I mentioned, they are on my Instagram. And I want you to take a quick look at the first couple Polaroid photos. I attached probably two of them or so, or I'm going to attach about two of them or so. Those Polaroid photos taken by Ed Walters, and then the replicated photo by the Pensacola News Journal. Um, so you're going to have one that I will label. That's the one that was replicated by the Pensacola News Journal. You have the two real photographs, and then you also have a close-up picture of the model on my Instagram. And there are a lot of similarities. I'm not going to shy away from saying that there is a lot of similarities between the photographs. However, there does look like there's some differences. The Polaroids look very overexposed. I mean, I'm not a photography expert by any means, but there's a lot of extra light or smudging or whatever it may be in the photographs that really blurs everything. So you can't see, you know, the fine detail that's in the photographs that were re that were replicated by the Pensacola News Journal. You know, the Pensacola News Journal photograph is very sharp lines, very sharp edges, but it kind of is very, very close to the Ed Walters' Polaroid photographs. Um, then, past this point, you know, moving on from Ed Walters, the UFO sightings in the Gulf Breeze, Pensacola region of Florida continue into 1991. And this area continues to see the impact of sightings even years after everything that took place within these short stretch of years. Obviously, as I said, this area was rocked by UFO sightings from the 1987 to 1991 range and obviously continues to see the impacts of that. Obviously, Florida MUFON is very involved still in the Gulf Breeze, Pensacola region just because of the reputation it is slowly built for itself just from your occasional UFO sighting and also what took place um, during this Gulf Breeze UFO incident. And that being said, it kind of brings us into theories and what my opinion on what actually happened. Now, I have a couple different theories. So obviously, you probably have three different theories here. The first one being, everything is real. Ed Walters' photographs are real. Ed Walters' stories are real. And all of the stories that are reported by people over the course of 1987 into 1991 are all real. Everything's real, nothing is faked, and there's evidence to back it up. Which, a part of me really, really, really wants to believe this. As somebody who has, you know, had a passion for the unknown, the unexplained, and obviously that naturally leads you into UFOs when you start talking about the unknown and the unexplained, for someone who has looked at UFO encounters and have heard of UFO encounters and done research on UFO encounters, and this is one that I had not heard about, and doing all the research basically from a blank slate, a part of me really, really wants to believe this. 
but I really, really can't buy this. There's too many wrinkles in Ed Walters' story for me to truly buy this one in particular. And the second theory. This one is a little bit more complex, but the initial encounter took place and seen by Ed Walters and his wife was real. So the first set of Polaroid photographs he had were genuine, and that first encounter was real. But he thought no one would believe such a story, so he fabricated more pictures to prove it. He sent in pictures under an unknown moniker to reduce public speculation, and then when his identity was out of the bag and people figured out, obviously, okay, these, these were Ed, you know, it wasn't, you know, whatever, because now Ed's showing the pictures once his identity was found out. Um, once people figured that out and he knew that there was a lot of public interest coming his way and he knew he could probably make some money off of it, he ran with the hoax that the, that the images were real. And... That could include all the images being fake. And him having that first encounter, seeing the UFO and saying, wow, this is absolutely unbelievable. Nobody's going to believe me whatsoever. I need to come up with some sort of evidence. You know, and he does, and he fakes the photographs. And then, like I said, public interest comes his way. And he's like, wow, a lot of public interest is coming my way. Maybe I can make some money out of this. And obviously, money talks. So... The initial Ed Walters encounter was real, but the rest of the story wasn't. The images, the videos, everything else was faked, but the initial encounter Ed Walters has was real. And finally, the Ed Walters story is a hoax. Everything about Ed Walters' story is hogwash, it's fake, it was a hoax made to stir public speculation of UFOs being in the Gulf Breeze, Pensacola area. However, this brings into question the other claims that people witness in the area of UFOs. So these should be taken into question. I feel like the encounters that people claim to have had with UFOs in the Gulf Breeze, Pensacola area that were mm -hmm. isolated instances and not related to Ed Walters have a lot more legitimacy to them. And I think they have a lot more validity to them than Ed Walters' story. So I think that the encounters that people experienced over Gulf Breeze and Pensacola during that span of 1987 to 1991, those isolated sightings, I think those are legitimate. But the Ed Walters story, again, is the wrinkle in everything. And again, my personal theory. Again, I want to buy Ed Walters' story so bad because there's so much of it of a UFO person. If you're looking into UFOs, there's so much of it that you want to believe and so much of it that you want to just think actually happened, you know, cause it's great. You think about, Oh, he took, he took so many pictures. He took a video, you know, this is, this is, this is great. You know, this is the best thing that is, this is the best UFO evidence that have come out since, you know, whenever you want to believe it. But as somebody who looks at the facts and as somebody who just has a very, very hard time just thinking that this actually happened, I think the Ed Walters story is fake. I think everything that he told was fake. I think it was a cash grab. He knew about the UFO sightings going on in the area. He took it upon himself to make an opportunity to make a couple bucks. Whether or not that was true... Remains to be seen. Obviously, if you go online and you Google um, the Gulf Breeze UFO incident, it does look like there is there is a couple books that have been made, um, and it looks like there was even a a TV show and or movie um, about the Gulf Breeze UFO incident. Obviously, the Gulf Breeze UFO incident generated enough headlines, so it. Then this is actually a little tidbit for you, and actually made a brief cameo on the X-Files. There was a part in the X-Files where, you know, the lead character of the X-Files says that when I saw the Gulf Breeze UFO images, I knew that they were faked. And that, I mean, it's a TV show, obviously. But that again, there's been speculation about whether or not the photos have been faked for a very long time. So, again, I think the Ed Walter story is fake. However, I think the accounts of all others seeing UFOs in the Gulf Breeze, Pensacola area are legitimate, and those should be investigated. 
I think there are, frankly, too many of these stories taking place during the same time period and everything like that for them all possibly to be fake. I think collusion in the townspeople to create a story of this magnitude where it's like, okay, let's all get together and let's all talk about UFOs, you know, that, that I think that a, to collude and create a story of that magnitude would be close to impossible. And the only ones who seemed to profit off the story was Ed Walters and his wife. Seemed like to be the only ones who were offered, you know, the book deal, TV minis miniseries, you know, to get money. Everybody else didn't seem like they, they got mon monetary gain, you know, if they made their stories up too. So I think the, the UFO sightings in the Gulf Breeze, Pensacola area are factual and that they happened and the Ed Walters story is fake. Um, do I think some of these unrelated sightings in the area could be debunked? Yes, but so can any other UFO sighting. Um, stories in the area, although, again, this kind of piggybacking off that, you know, some of the unrelated sightings could be jumping on, you know, the, the bandwagon that the Ed Walters, you know, fame made, but I think most of them are legit, and I think that there's too many isolated cases of UFO sightings in the Gulf Breeze, Pensacola area for them to be ignored. I think, again, it was very interesting researching this because, like I said, it was something that I hadn't fully looked into, or it hasn't something that I even looked into, to be honest with you, and I think there was kind of a reason that I hadn't heard about it, honestly. There's a lot of, you know, it's a very popular incident within the UFO community, but I think there's a reason that I didn't hear about it because I am not big into chasing fake stories. I don't want to chase a fake story. I don't want to chase something that didn't happen. And I think in the case of Ed Walters' story, it didn't happen. I think Ed Walters is a con man of the greatest proportion and that he made this story up and the facts just point that way that he made it up. Between the model, between the photographs being replicated, between the TV deal and the book deal and everything in between, I think there's too much, too much there to say that he did this with... You know, that he saw the UFOs and that he had all these encounters, you know, just for whatever it may be. I think that, I think Ed Walters is completely a hoax here. Um, but I understand why people are consistently split on the idea of whether or not this story is true or whether it is fake. Again, I think why people are so torn on that is because of all the other sightings. I think all the other sightings are genuine and that those should be investigated because those are isolated instances However, Ed Walters in this story, I obviously gave my opinion. But that being said, that ends today's episode of Unblurring the Unknown. If you like this episode, please, you can go leave me a comment underneath the video. Uh, send me an email, you know, comment on Instagram, do whatever you want to do. Um, if you like this, please let me know. I'm obviously, you know, this is... A, a really new thing for me, and obviously I appreciate your guys' support so far, and I just really want to make that known. But that being said, I really appreciate you guys turning in, tuning in to this episode of Unblurring the Unknown, and I will see you on the next one.